you're probably inundated with people speaking into the tragedy of the shooting that occurred at the elementary school in Texas this week. And, and I don't really have anything to add to what you've probably heard already. But I also didn't want to let it slide on by as if the events didn't happen because they did. And, and even though they're far away from, from most of us, at some level, they affect all of us. Now, to me, there's no other word for what happened than evil. I mean, shooting defenseless people at a grocery store in Buffalo, shooting defenseless people at a church in Orange County, and now, this week, shooting defenseless children, elementary school children at a school in Texas. There is no sense in any of that. It's evil, pure and simple. And I think that the evil one is smiling, maybe even laughing. See, I think we forget sometimes how much the devil hates God and hates God's world, and how the devil will do whatever he can to fan the flames of anger and prejudice and racism and violence in order to bring division and destruction and devastation into people's lives and communities. And here's an uncomfortable truth. We can restrain evil and we should, but we can't completely stop evil. That's not going to happen until Jesus returns on Judgment Day. And I also have to admit, in that kind of a world, one of my blind spots in that reality, the reality that evil will always be showing up somewhere, is that I kind of get used to that a little bit. And if it doesn't really affect me personally or my community personally, I'm going to stop and think about it for a minute. And then I'll just kind of move on really quickly. Maybe I have a moment of silence and then just move on to my everyday life. And, you know, I think I know I can do better than that. Here's a few things I think we can do, not just in a moment of silence, but in an ongoing basis. We can pray for the people in the communities that are devastated by those shootings. And we can keep praying because their grief, their pain, the, that's not going to go away anytime soon. We can pray for God to keep our schools and communities safe. I mean, that's part of my ongoing routine every day, to, to pray for protection on our, our church and our school and our community. We can pray for God to stop evil and, and senseless violence everywhere from having what I'd call free reign. We can also work to make our society more civil. And I think we can also, as citizens, we can work for the changes for good that we wish to see in our communities, but do so with, with graciousness and with wisdom. Now. That's not what today's message is about. I just think it needed to be said. But, but here's at least a little tangential, um, slight little connection to Peter's letter that we're looking at. See, Peter's speaking to a world where there's a lot of evil stuff going on in society, and some of it's institutionalized. And he's also speaking to, to Christians who are the recipients of all sorts of hate speech and hate crimes, again, some of which are even legal. And in, in times where struggle and suffering seem to be what these new Christians are experiencing on a regular basis more than anything else, what Peter's doing is he's writing to offer hope and encouragement and a way to make it through. Let's peek in on what he says.
So there's good news and there's bad news in that little clip that you just watched. That was one of the last lines that Peter wrote in his letter. Bad news first. There, there will be suffering when you follow Jesus. There will be stress and strain and struggles that come just because you're a Christian. And if you're being faithful, you really can't avoid that. For most people, it's not all the time, though for some it is. But when you walk with Jesus, some suffering will be your lot in life. And there are times when it even gets worse before it gets better. Now, that's the bad news. And maybe you've been living some of that yourself recently. But, but here's the good news. The good news is while it's not an easy road, it is a manageable one. Suffering isn't how the story ends. And, and when you're suffering, you don't have to go through it alone. And when you're wounded in the struggle, God actually promises restoration. And so here's our task in this good news, bad news context. Our task is going to be to endure suffering. Not to skip it or avoid it or escape it. That's impossible. And not to detour around it. Because the easier way, settling, is usually not the best way or the right way. Our task when suffering because we're following Jesus, is to survive it, to make it through, to have the courage to endure. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's what this week's conversations are about. Before we go on, I just want you to take a few minutes to think about what you've already learned about that in your life. Stop and think for a minute about this. And if you're watching or listening with someone, talk about it. What have you found that it's helped you endure the suffering that you faced because you're a Christian? Go ahead and do that now. Well, in the messages this week, we're going to talk about a two-part plan to help you endure the suffering that you face because you're a Christian. Part one is perspective, uh, the way you look at things, which is what this conversation that you're tuning into is about. Part two is a plan of action, and we're going to talk about that Sunday in the on-site message. And if you're part of our online community, you can access that by following the link in the video description of this message. And the podcast, that podcast is going to be available for you starting on Monday. So let's get into part one. Perspective, meaning how you look at things. First part of perspective is this. If you're a follower of Jesus, some suffering is inevitable. It is guaranteed. It's, it's coming. And there's two big reasons for that. Okay, the first is the cultural context. Remember Peter's writing to people in the culture that misunderstands and misrepresents Christians and, and sometimes is hostile to Christians. Uh, Christians in Peter's day tended to find themselves made fun of a lot and X'd out of certain social circles they used to run in. And sometimes it was even worse than that. In some of the churches that are reading Peter's letter, they're facing physical persecutions as well. Some of them started to get pretty intense. Some of them were even losing their lives because of their faith. Now, other than that last one, physical persecution, aren't we in a very similar cultural context? And so shouldn't we expect the same sort of a cultural pushback and, and the suffering that comes along with it? See, that's why Peter writes this, uh, chapter 4, verse 12. I'm reading from the NLT. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through. 
as if something strange were happening to you. Peter says, don't be surprised. It's not strange, given our cultural context. Some suffering because you're following Jesus is inevitable. The other reason it's inevitable is because Satan is always on the attack. Now, now understand this. The devil is not some cute little cartoon character sitting on your shoulder, whispering into your ear, trying to get you to do something, oh, slightly mischievous. If you're a believer, Satan has made it his life's mission to rip you apart from God. Right? He's, he's, he's made it his life's mission to undermine your relationship with Jesus, and to destroy your faith, and, and to make your life in general miserable. And the devil is going to do everything that he can and use every single weapon at his disposal, including suffering. He hates God and he hates God's world that much. Peter describes it this way. I'm jumping ahead to chapter 5, verse 8. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Now, devour is like an animal, literally, that word means an animal swallowing its prey, almost if it can in a, in a single gulp. In other words, Satan's looking not just to hurt you, he's looking to annihilate you. He's, he's looking to annihilate you, to rip you apart, to rip you from God, and guess what? Satan doesn't take any days off, does he? Uh, now, sometimes people think that if you become a Christian, it, it means that there shouldn't be any suffering anymore, or, or at the very least, very little. Uh, people even think that even if they believe strongly enough, that somehow maybe God owes them a, a certain amount of success. And sometimes they look at the world that's a mess, and they wonder, well, what's going on here? I mean, God's people are suffering, and evil seems to be winning and with no punishment at all. What gives with that? Maybe you're even in one of those places right now. And that's a pretty understandable drift. Any of those three are. But none of those mindsets actually helps us endure suffering. In fact, in many ways, those mindsets actually make it worse, at least as it affects our, our moods and our attitudes about God. And so what Peter does here is he speaks hard truths into those mindsets, and he tells us quite plainly, again, perspective, if you're faithfully following Jesus, some suffering is inevitable. But here's the good news. Peter also tells us that that suffering is survivable, which is why as he wraps up his letter, Peter's telling us not how to avoid suffering, but how to endure it. Okay, again, the big point Peter's making is that perspective helps with that. Perspective point number one, suffering is inevitable if you're following Jesus. Perspective point number two, it's not just you that's suffering. All right, Peter writes this, chapter 5, verse 9. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Now, how does that help? See, when, you're, when you think you're the only one that's suffering because of your faith, or at least the only one that's going through the sort of really hard stuff that you are, your tendency is, well, it, it gets so, so lonely. And it's easy to start feeling sorry for yourself and as you're feeling sorry for yourself and feeling so lonely and isolated, it's easy to get discouraged so much that you feel like giving up. Well, Peter says here, don't. Don't give up. Don't get discouraged and give up. You're not the only one. You're not all alone. There, there's lots of other people in the same boat. It's kind of like it's a shared battlefield. We really are all in this together. Just think about that for a moment. Before we move on in the conversation, I want you to stop and think about where have you seen other Christians in your community, maybe people that, that you know and rub shoulders with, where have you seen them experiencing that sort of suffering or rejection 
because of their faith. Go ahead and think about that. And if you're with someone, talk about that right now. We are in this together, aren't we? Suffering because you're following Jesus is a common experience of Christians throughout our community. And, and you know, it, it really does help. Let, let's say when you're being ridiculed or made, made fun of for your beliefs, it really does help to know that other Christians are experiencing the same thing. So that there's, you, you know that there's nothing wrong with you personally that's bringing all that on. It also helps frankly, to know that you're not alone in this struggle. That there are others out there as you're struggling and you're suffering for your faith who believe the same way that you do. And, and knowing that you're not standing all alone by yourself, I think that helps you endure. And then there's this. Yeah, sometimes the stuff that we face as a result of following Jesus is hard, Sometimes it's tough, sometimes it's really, really intense. But some of those other Christians out there, uh, they have it a lot harder than we do. Now, as, before we move on, I want you to take some time to think about that, too. Uh, I want you to take some time to just hit pause and search for some stories of other Christians throughout the world who have it much worse than, than you do. Some of those are in places that we partner with, like the people that work for Mission India. Now here's a couple of websites that you can use to check that out. Persecution.com, that's the voice of the martyrs, and persecution.org. I mean, go ahead and, and check that out. And, and then before you continue with this conversation, Here's one simple, immediate step that you can take. Stop and pray for those who are in those sort of situations. Stop and pray for those fellow believers, those Christians who are on the same team as you throughout the world who are experiencing suffering and rejection and, yeah, even persecution because of their faith. Here's the third part of perspective. When the sky's falling, take cover. Right now, when the sky's falling, by that I mean that when, when the suffering's particularly intense and it seems like everything's crashing down around you. Uh, well, when that happens, take cover. I mean, understand that you actually do have protection. Peter told you that right in the beginning of the letter. Let me read it again, chapter 1, verse 5. Through faith, you are shielded by God's mighty power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now again, the picture there is that you're really under attack and it's like these arrows and these fiery darts are, are raining down on you and that's really not letting up. And suffering's like that sometimes, isn't it? Uh, really intense a relentless attack on what seems as every part of your being. And what Peter wants you to know there is you're not alone, right? You're not defenseless. You, you have help. You, you have a shield to protect you. You're actually shielded by God's mighty power, by, by God's mighty power. He's already shown you that he's stronger than whatever attacks you by rising from the dead. Now, he uses that power to help you and to keep you safe when you're being attacked and assaulted by suffering. The Almighty Lord and the all-powerful God, the risen Christ, is, is your shield. And he's promised to always be there for you, no matter what, to never leave you or forsake you, to be a strong refuge in every kind of trouble. So, so when the sky is falling, take cover. You have a shield. It's the almighty power of God. Well, we'll use it. I mean, use your shield. It'd be kind of dumb not to, wouldn't it? 
I mean, to have all these things raining down on you like you're in the middle of some, some bombardment in war uh, and you're like, hey, okay, I'll just stand out here. I'll, don't have, I'm going to take this all myself. You, you don't have to. You have protection. You have a shield. Use it. Uh, what that means here is run to Jesus when the suffering's intense. Don't, don't run away from him. Don't try to do this all by yourself. You're, you're not alone. Hide there in Jesus so that the worst doesn't crush you or destroy you. Now, you might get wounded by some debris. That happens. But this shield is strong enough to, to protect you and make sure th that you're not completely crushed, which means it's going to help you endure. And that's what Peter's talking about in, in chapter 4, verse 19. Because you know that, because you have that perspective. He says this, Trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. When the sky's falling, take cover. Trust God to protect you. Go run into Jesus. And then, after the sky stops falling, meaning there's a little bit of a lull in the, in the suffering, and there probably will be. Um, you can do a couple of things. Uh, first, thank God that he was your shield. Thank God that he was there to protect you uh, during that suffering, and he helped you through it. And then, you know, venture out and look around to see if you can turn over some of those rocks and find some good not in the suffering itself, that, that's never good, right? Um, but suffering, uh, while it's hard and it hurts, which, which is not good, um, when the skies stop falling, perhaps, perhaps you can find that some good came out of the suffering. All right? and, and in that regard, Peter gives you a couple of things to think about. I'm reading now from uh, chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Dear friends, don't be surprised by the terrible things happening to you. The trouble you're having has come to test you. So don't feel as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be joyful that you are taking part in Christ's sufferings. And when he says you're taking part in Christ's sufferings, what Peter's saying here is, again, is finding the good that comes through suffering. What he's saying is when you're suffering for right, you're identifying more closely with Jesus, who also suffered for right, and, and who continued to do the right thing, even though it meant great personal cost to himself. And, and so when you're enduring innocent suffering, uh, you're following in Jesus' steps. And in a way, you're kind of being drawn into what he experienced. And, and I don't really understand how this works or why it is, but what I have found is that also then deepens your relationship with Jesus. And that's a good thing, right? Deepening your relationship with Jesus. And then there's this, uh, verse 12 again of chapter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the, now I'm focusing on the phrase, fiery trials that you're going through, as if something strange were happening. You see, that phrase, fiery trials, has behind it the idea of a fiery ordeal to test you, and the testing there being to strengthen you and to purify you like, like metals refined by fire. Now, Peter also talked about that in chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 6 and 7. These trials have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. See, what Peter is pointing out here, and again, that's perspective, is that God can actually use suffering, which Satan intended to hurt you, to harm you, to destroy you, to devour you, to rip you away from God. If you endure that, God can actually use that to help you. See, it's... It's the struggle and the suffering that so often produces growth in our faith. Growth that wouldn't have been there without it. So again, that's a good thing, right? I mean, can you think of times that that's happened in your life? I mean, I sure can. I mean, the gray hair that I've got tells you that I've lived long enough that I've got lots of stories. And I can tell you that the suffering, it was never pleasant. Not one single time. 
sometimes it was really hard. And I, and I think I've got still the, the scars from some of that. But you know what? My faith grew stronger through that. I can look back and see how the suffering and the struggle helped my faith to grow and, and to grow stronger. And that's what I've needed in the most recent round of stuff that I went through. A stronger faith that was able to deal with that stuff. So that's a good thing, right? Growth in our faith that helps us endure the suffering that comes. Now, getting that sort of perspective helps you endure, helps you hang in there and keep going and keep believing and trusting in God when suffering makes that a really hard thing to do. And there's one more thing in perspective that helps too, and that's to remember the end game. Uh, back to one of those last phrases that Peter wrote in this letter. I'm reading from chapter 5, beginning at verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, now here comes the end game, he will restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory, the end end game, will, after you've suffered, restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. What Peter's saying is that when you're in the middle of, of suffering because you're following Jesus, it helps to keep the end of the story in mind. And the end of the story is that if we stick with Jesus, in the end, we win. And if we stick with Jesus, in the end, we are fully and completely, Peter says, restored. And if we stick with Jesus, in the end, we live in a place where suffering can never touch us again. And Satan can't either because he's been fully and completely defeated. Seeing the end gives us the perspective to hang in there and endure the suffering that we face right now because we want to get to that end. And it also clears up our vision just enough to see that some of that restoration that God promises, that it's already begun, even as the suffering continues. That we have restored health and restored relationships and restored spirits and restored souls. And some of that all happens now. As you see how faithful and loving Jesus is through all the suffering that you're going through, and, you know, suffering, yeah, it might knock you to your knees. Um, but it's on your knees, I found, that you see Jesus more clearly. It's on your knees that you discover, in, even, even in your most intense suffering, that you were never alone. That Jesus, who suffered for you, was also there with you in your suffering he was there with you in your suffering and your struggles, shielding you and protecting you and, and holding you close and holding you, keeping you safe and, and holding you up and, and helping you to endure. And that's a good thing, right? Seeing how good Jesus is, not just in the good times, but at all times. And that's perspective. Perspective that helps us endure suffering. Uh, perspective. Yeah, some of the suffering is inevitable when you follow Jesus. But um, you're not alone in this. There's a bunch of other believers who are also struggling and suffering too as they're following Jesus. And when it's really intense, when you're in one of those sky is falling moments, you do have a, a shield to protect you. So, so go ahead and, and, and run for cover. And yes, yeah, suffering isn't good in itself, but some good can come through suffering, like the strengthening of our faith and perspective. We know how the story ends. If we stick with Jesus, we win. All that's perspective. Perspective that we need. Perspective that helps us endure the suffering that we're going through. That's big point number one for how we endure. Big point number two, after we get perspective, what's to come up with a plan of action? 
things to actually do during the struggle, during the struggle and the suffering that, that help you endure it. Now that's Sunday's on-site message. Again, if you're part of our online community, you can access that by going back to the video description of this video and clicking on the link and that'll take you to the podcast and follow the links there. That particular message will be up for you on Monday.